Good morning. This is Tristan. We're here live on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, at least if I've done this correctly, with Allison Pierre. Hi, Allison. Hello. Good morning. Let me let me give everybody just a quick introduction to who we are and what's happening here. My name is Tristan Higgins, and I am the founder of Metaclusive LLC. Um, as uh, 24 years as a lawyer, I decided to found Metaclusive to help corporations and organizations advance and create belonging and equity in their workplaces. And why? Because employees who feel like they belong save you money and increase your bottom line revenue. It's as simple as that. Whether you're just starting your DNI efforts or whether you've spent a great deal of resources on it, I can help you move forward to create an environment where all of your employees feel they belong. In this series, instead of focusing on DNI in particular, we highlight how industry leaders advance and create belonging and equity in using an intersectional lens. We discuss what our leaders have done, what they think is crucial to this work, and what they wish they had known when they got started. I am lucky enough to be able to sit down with leaders who are setting the standard and making waves. And today we're doing something a little different. Today we're speaking with Alison Pierre, and I'm so excited for you to learn all about what she does and how she's changing not just her workplace, but the world. So without further ado, Alison Pierre is a reform advocate. She's a former prosecutor from the Brooklyn DA's office and the US Attorney's Office in DC. Her focus is to support treatment programs and to end racial disparities in state prosecutor offices. She loves this work and is ready to make transformational change. Allison, welcome. Mm -hmm. Welcome. How Can you, are you tell us all? I'm <clears throat> great. Tell us all a little bit about yourself now that I've given the you know the formal introduction. <laughs> yes, I I love that introduction. The but I think the best way to describe me as a person who has taken um, a, a huge transformational change of my own because I dove into criminal justice reform with so much energy and passion. I do love this work. And the reason I did this was because it's really a part of who I am. I really feel it's my calling. So for me, a big part of who I am right now is just making an uh, impactful, real change. Well, can you tell us how you went from, I, I'm a former prosecutor myself, you and I share that in common, though I did the more minor crimes, you know, the ones that are fine to sleep at night. And you did the heavy, heavy lifting really in the district attorney's office, both in Brooklyn and DC and the US attorneys. Why did you decide to leave that? Can you tell us a little more about what happened in, you know, that's a big, le that's a big leap. It's a tremendous leap. When I left the US attorney's office in DC and also the Brooklyn DA's office, I knew that I loved criminal justice. And I had thought that I would continue on being a, a prosecutor as my career, but I made a major change in my, uh, my views of criminal justice after reading one book that really just changed my, my heart, my soul. And the book was, is called The New Jim Crow Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And because of that book and a slew of other writings, I decided that now was the time to actually be an outsider from government to try to change government to be more fair and specifically to look at how prosecutors can give people of color a fair experience. And I think you're talking about Michelle Alexander's book, right? Yes, Michelle Alexander is the thought leader for prosecution reform and a tremendous um, advocate for reform. Now, I, I happen to have a similar journey. Uh, you and I share this in common. Um, having read the same book um, mm. a couple years ago when a, a judge said, what do you know about criminal justice reform? And I said, um, I know what the words mean. <laughs> and he said that I should read that book. And But I wasn't a prosecutor when I read it. And um, it's very critical right, of our justice system. How did you feel as a prosecutor being part of that when you read it? I mean, that must have been really like intense. I actually read the book after I left the prosecutor's office in DC, okay. but it was still intense because I had to come to grips with the fact that I was a part of a system that I realized was uh, unfair in, in some ways to specific communities, poor communities and communities of color. And it, it felt like a deep pain that I was being 
um, a, an awakened, so to speak, of the true nature of the criminal justice system that I uh, revered. And I took that pain and decided to not just be dissatisfied, I made a policy reform on working with state prosecutors to help them bring about real transformational change, specifically using technology. Can you say more about that? Using technology, what does that, what, I mean, we know what technology means, but what do you mean when you say it uh, as far as bringing about change? I noticed that prosecutors as well as a lot of criminal justice agencies are about 40 to 50 years behind in terms of using data analysis and technology. And the specific technology that I'm looking at is data visualization, which is just a fancy word for a dashboard. But the way I want to use it is using external dashboards, public dashboards, and internal dashboards in an office so that the elected district attorney can make decisions using fresh live data that can actually make impact on how the staff, which are line prosecutors, do their job. And then also use a public dashboard so that that same prosecutor can figure out how to serve the community and tell the community that she serves that she is going to protect and serve everyone in the community equally. So how does that, I would imagine, you know, some of the people watching already understand this pretty well, but if I'm, if I'm fresh, you know, fresh to the issue, um, isn't our criminal justice system um, fair? I mean, isn't that the whole point is to, you know, protect and serve and to be fair and impartial? What is the problem? I mean, we're not talking about police violence, right? We're talking about something in the prosecutorial system. Can you tell us more about how that Kind of comes about. I mean, I was a prosecutor and I would have sworn up one side and down the other that I was entirely fair and impartial and doing, you know, really that good work of justice. And after getting to know you and having read the book, I sort of sick to think that I may have, you know, will certainly was affected by bias that I wasn't aware of. Can you tell us a little yeah. more about that? Well, that feeling of how a prosecutor can be fair is something that I struggled with as well because I felt I was fair when I was doing this job in the Brooklyn DA's office and at the U.S. Attorney's office. And I think most prosecutors do their best and are good people and are fair, thought-driven people. But the reality is that there are significant racial disparities. For instance, um, sentencing and charging, there are typically harsher consequences for uh, like for instance, a higher incident of charging people of color, more harsher charges, more charges, more severe charges, as well as sentencing recommendations, which are two things that prosecutors do. They charge people and they have a sentence that they recommend after the charge is, is filed. And most prosecutors don't understand the ramifications of race and how that does come into an unintentionally into how they make decisions. The other thing that is important that prosecutors don't know that I didn't know is that there's many significant consequences just to a misdemeanor mm -hmm. conviction. Mm -hmm. If you get a misdemeanor conviction, you can't vote. You cannot apply for affordable housing. Your welfare benefits will be stopped. You can't get a professional license. You can't sit on a jury. These collateral consequences, most prosecutors, they don't understand or know about, and I didn't know about it, about those things. The, the point is that my goal is to just evolve our profession to inform new hires and line prosecutors that we have to really be very thoughtful and careful about race, talk about it, and then two, to bring our profession into the digital age by using software mm. technology and data and analysis. Did you say that if you have a misdemeanor, you can't vote? In some states, it's wow. not only you can't vote, but you can't sit on a jury. And every state has different rules regarding that, but the, the consequences are so severe. You cannot um, get a professional license. 
trying to rent an apartment or trying to get any position that really requires a federal application, if you want to work for the federal government, that's going to be a problem. And even getting an expungement sometimes can be very difficult, depending on the state. And so I, I would gather, you know, some people might think, well, if you get a misdemeanor, then you deserve all of that. Um, are, are you saying, maybe I'll kind of give an example, but we've all heard of the, you know, a, a man who is arrested for assault and if he's black, he's going away forever. Um, but if he's white, he is told he's a fine young lad and, and sent on his way. Are, are you talking about that kind of disparity? Are you talking about the difference between possession of meth and the difference between possession of cocaine? Right. I mean, can you give a maybe a concrete example of what that looks like, how that might show up? Sure. Most disparities that have been going on for a few generations are drug possession and sale. An example would be marijuana possession. All races possess marijuana at the same rate. But African-Americans, for instance, in Virginia, which is close to the jurisdiction where I am, they're arrested at a higher rate and they're prosecuted for the, that misdemeanor crime. And that means that there's a racial disparity in how that offense is being um, prosecuted. And that just a misdemeanor criminal possession of marijuana is significant because if that's on your record, then it has all these ne negative collateral consequences. But it's not just marijuana. There's a lot of drug offenses where the sentencing recommendations um, were different uh, for crack cocaine versus um, powder cocaine. And traditionally, I think back in the 90s and 80s, most the, mostly the white community was using powder cocaine, which had a, a lesser um, sentence than crack cocaine, which was mostly used by African Americans. And there's other disparities as well. There's been research about this through different thought leaders, uh, Professor Angela J. Davis at Washington uh, College of Law. She's a thought leader in prosecution reform. The Vera Institute of Justice has spent several years looking at prosecutors' decision-making and race and this has been a, a long-standing fact that there is a racial disparity in prosecutor uh, decision-making. The key thing to remember now is what are we going to do to fix it? Now is the mm -hmm. time for the reckoning, and that's where my policy reform program comes in. How do we make a fix? And it has to be Can done now. It has to be done now. I agree. And and and. People are paying more attention now than they used to be, so that's a positive. Yeah. How does how does data and technology help if I'm a line prosecutor? Which, for those of you that aren't prosecutors, line prosecutor means you're the one every day doing the job, you know, issuing the cases, handling the trials, and reviewing papers, rather than the you know department chairs and and, and chiefs, right? That's that's what we're talking about. Um, how does your company? What does the data do to inter, inter, sort of intervent, intervene in that yeah. process? How does it make a difference? Well, envision this. Let's say I just got hired at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, and my manager has a data dashboard on her desktop, and she can see that a lot of her cases are prostitution cases. Maybe 9% of the caseload for her trial bureau are prostitution cases from her internal data dashboard. And because so many of her cases are prostitution cases, she'll decide to create a treatment program. It would be a treatment program that is affordable housing, job training, and mental health for the defendants who are um, charged with prostitution. If they become a part of this program, then the policy would be for these kinds of cases, certain kinds of cases will be eligible for that kind of uh, treatment program. And the line prosecutor who just starts the job will have to follow that policy because that supervisor looked at her internal data and figured out how she was going to handle those kinds of cases. The net result is if those folks that get arrested for prostitution and they do well and they finish 
the program, then their case could get dismissed and they can start their life without a misdemeanor conviction. The line prosecutor can see that there's another path, an alternative to incarceration, an alternative to a charge, and then the boss or the deputy can continue to look at the internal data every day and make other policy decisions about other cases. Wow. Are there are there a lot of people that are doing this work that you're doing? This is new innovative work. And the reason why it's new is because there are not a lot of people doing this. There's 2,300 prosecutor offices in the country and there's only a handful, maybe less than 10 that have public data dashboards. And there's not many that I know of that have internal data dashboards, but it's not so much the dashboards, it's the culture of showing the prosecutors to look at their data, analyze it, and then make an informed decision. And what we do that's unique is we're combining the policy with this data visualization software, which is the data dashboard. So you take policy, dashboard, combine it with um, my work with some other key partners like American University School of Public Affairs. We have a racial justice trainer, and we also have a public relations entity. These key partners will bring all of their services to a prosecutor's office to really evolve the whole culture of the office so that going forward for the next generation of prosecutors, there's a, a shift in how new hires and supervisors approach a case. When they pick up a file, they think about it differently. Hmm. That's so exciting, Allison, the work that you're doing. Um, what ha I think this effort is a little bit newer for you, right? You've only been doing this for <laughs> is it about a, a year, year and a half, and a half now. Half. Yeah, this a year is and a, half. a new endeavor. And so what's been your biggest challenge so far? Oh, I'm sorry. Please well, go ahead, Allison. The reason why it's new, and then I'll say what the biggest challenge is. Um, the reason why it's a new endeavor for me is because I was awakened after doing my own research. And I think the timing is right now because there has been a national awakening, not just my own personal one, but our whole nation sees that there is racial disparities in the criminal justice system from everything, all the killings that happened in our, in our country with unarmed black men. Uh, the greatest challenge that I have been uh, facing is really harnessing enough uh, funding support. And that is mm. very important because the unique part about this work is it's not something normally that um, most district attorneys can afford to hire a, uh, an entity like my uh, entity, which is Innovative Prosecution Consulting. So we rely on foundation funding to do our work. We're not working in a way that would be profitable. We are working just to put progress over profit, which means that our funding has to come from a foundation to support our work. So that's the challenge. But we do have uh, a potential first funder, and we're really excited about that. So funding has been your biggest challenge. Um, how about <clears throat> when you're talking to the offices, what is a, what's an obstacle? Do you, do you face sort of a denial bias or are people saying, yes, we need this, but we just can't afford it. Like what, what's the, what are you facing when you start talking to the district attorneys or the city attorneys? There is a incredible hunger for the elected mm -hmm. and the executive staff to make real dynamic system changes. Their hurdle that they have is they don't have the technical analysis capability. And that's why I've brought in American University School of Public Affairs to do the analysis for them. And our goal is to teach them how to do the analysis once we leave their office. The major hurdle for a lot of these offices is that they don't have an on-staff director of research and, or a policy analyst. But they're evolving, and I think the work I'm doing will encourage them to hire, in addition to a paralegal, they'll hire a policy analyst or director of policy and data. But the good thing is that the offices that I'm currently uh, working with are very committed, and they are 
ecstatic to get started. We just need support from more foundations to help really implement the work. Hmm. And, wh and what would you say is the, the most fun about what you're doing? I mean, this is heavy, right? This is heavy yeah. stuff. And um, I think for, for most of us, I'll just say most, most white people, it's new to be this focused on the racial disparities and the lack of racial equity, right? And we didn't used to pay attention. We were sort of ignorant, right? Intentionally ignorant, I think you could say. Um, but how do you continue to find joy? I mean, how do you keep yourself um, you know, passionate about moving forward? Uh, there are moments where I, I do feel exasperated because I, I, I'm, so hungry to to fix what I what I see very clearly, and I, I see a different future for us. But when I get it, that feeling of frustration, immediately the joy comes because I'll get an email or text from a friend or family member who will say, "Have you seen this article? Have you checked out this mm -hmm. video? You need to think about this." They're more excited about criminal justice reform and reform than I am, and they keep uh -huh. me rejuvenated because they want this done. I have two college interns who are working for me for free and they are a junior and senior and they want to be lawyers and they are giving me their time because they want me to do this work. I also have two attorneys who are giving me their time from a large law firm because they believe in this work. The joy is all around me. All I have to do <laughs> is just look at it. Because I now see that people want this done. They just need someone like myself who's willing to make some sacrifices and make it happen right now. And what does that look like? If if we have, um, I think we ha might have a couple of um, district attorneys or city attorneys or even def public defenders listening right now. What does it look like? Do they... If I'm a line prosecutor, do I call you? Do I go and talk to my elected? And and then if we do that, what does it look like when, when you come in? Can you talk us through that process? If you are a, a line prosecutor at a district attorney's office, you should definitely reach out to us on our, on our website. You can also reach me directly. My phone number is on the website. And what it would look like going forward is we would come to your office, we meaning uh, myself and my team, which is American University's um, and analytic staff. They have two professors that are fantastic that we'll be working with. It's American University School of Public Affairs and my project manager. We would go to the office, talk to the elected, as well as uh, mid-level supervisors and get a sense of the scope of the work that the elect is interested in analyzing. And we would have a roadmap of what we would like to accomplish over a specific time period. And that would depend on whatever the uh, elected wants to look at. If it, treat, it could be treatment court programs or prosecution uh, treatment court programs, or it could be racial disparities in sentencing or charging or plea offers. And we would provide our partners as well, which is several incredible entities one is a public relations entity called Walker Marchand Group. The other one is a, a racial justice trainer called the Still Center. And our communications manager is Idea Flights. We would bring in these other partners to also provide services. If the elected wanted to do a racial justice training for new hires, we would set that up. If the elected wanted to do a, a town hall with a particular community of color, we would have the public relations entity coach them through what the message should be. And that's the power of what we're doing. We're also working with um, uh, a couple of national nonprofits who are supporting of this work, Measures for Justice and the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. I, I can't type those all fast enough. Um, <laughs> I apologize to those wonderful entities. <laughs> Notes for next time. Well, um, yeah. tell us about the racial justice training. So I, you know, you know, I do uh, diversity and inclusion training. I focus on belonging. We talk about racism and white privilege, uh, sexism, homophobia. 
but that's different than racial justice training. Can you can you explain a little bit about what that is, what that is? I it's a mm -hmm. big complicated nut, right? But can you tell us a little bit about that? It would be executed by an attorney because you need an attorney to talk to other attorneys because we think in a certain way and we like to have <laughs> evidence and proof. And it we're, full, be, we're full of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we are a unique, special class of people. The Still Center has a wonderful attorney who does this kind of training at large law firms around the country. And she would come into a DA's office and talk to a class. And she would cultivate uh, a training either in person or virtually. It would be educating prosecutors about how race plays into decision making and the ramifications of it. And it would also include some readings as well. A lot of this has already been researched and written about in law review articles. But the training would be, I think, a combination of role playing and discussion, not just something where you sit in, in your lecture to. It would really look at what's happening in that jurisdiction that's specific. For instance, in Virginia and one office that we're thinking of working with, we would use the training to perhaps bring in someone who's been incarcerated before and have them talk to some new hires about what happened after they were released from prison and were they able to get a job or someone who has been through a, a prosecutor treatment program. The point is not to give a training where you are uh, lecturing prosecutors and they take notes and walk away with nothing. We want it to be interactive and based on data from that jurisdiction, wherever the office is located and people who have been involved in the um, uh, jail and prison system would probably be part of it as well. Wow. That sounds really impactful. I, um, yeah, no, I, I'm going to have to see if I can sit in on one of those when you do those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a different approach. And one more thing. Um, when I was a no, please. at the Brooklyn DA's office, and even at the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, we never went to a prison or a local city jail. And I think that's an important part of being a prosecutor. You should understand where you're sending somebody to and what that is. Mostly it's criminal defense attorneys who are behind um, the court where the jails or city jails are. And the, the other thing that I think is really important about reform is having more prosecutors of color in offices, um, in all levels, the statistics are really clear of uh, the 23 elected prosecutors around the country. Only 1.8%, uh, I think, are women of color. Most of, I think it's about 79% of all the elected prosecutors in our country are white men. So there's a, a lack of diversity at the very top in terms of gender and race. And that's something that I feel strongly needs to change. Wow. I, I And I'm thinking with pride that our San Diego district attorney is a woman, um, <laughs> yeah. Summer, Summer Stefan. So yay, San Diego. Um, well, let's see. So we, we only have about a minute left in our committed time. And uh, I'm not sure if the Facebook rules will like shut us off, but <laughs> what um, what is something that you wish you would have known when either when you were becoming a prosecutor or when you were starting your company, you know, this is really just kind of give us give us some some wisdom about what what you wish somebody had told you. Mm. I wish someone had told me uh, before I became a prosecutor that the the purpose of the job isn't just the adrenaline rush of doing a trial, even though that is powerful. The purpose of the job has to be how can I help this community that I serve grow? And specifically, what is my role in that courtroom, which is to seek justice, a fair outcome, which could be an acquittal or could be a case getting dismissed. And I, I think that that's what's... Um, Many prosecutors have that thought. So I applaud the prosecutors who 
who work like that. But I think the gap that's missing for today's prosecutor and the next generation, they want innovation and technology incorporated to take their job into the digital age. Mm. And that's the gap that I'm focused on going forward that we have to address. And we are. We are. It's, it's happening. That's exciting. Is, a, any um, last thing you want to add? We, I think I'm excited. Yeah. We have uh, nine people who've pretty consistently been watching us, which feels like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if I had done a better job, there'd be more because I certainly love listening to your, you know, you talk about your work. Oh, thank you. The last thing I'll add is I think the reason I love this work is because it's so personal to me because I'm doing this for my family, my friends, um, my backgrounds. I'm African-American. I come from a very tight knit family and my father has always been very thoughtful about trying to do things to help our community. He's a electrical engineer and my mother's uh, a teacher. She's always thought about how are we going to progress forward? So the reason I'm doing this is not only for my profession, but it, for me, it's very personal. I just love my community. I want them to have the same opportunity and feel safe, mm. just like all other communities in our country. Mm. Well, I think that's a really good um, note to end on. And I I just want to thank you so much, Allison, for joining us here and talking to us. Um, I'm assuming that people can contact you at the website, um, which I'll put up again one more time, um, if, if they want to reach out to you, right? Yes, please contact okay. us directly. Okay, excellent. And so um, people can do that. And I just, you know, wanted to say thank you for being here. Um, this is, you know, only the second of these Metaclusive Leadership Series and Advancing Belonging in the Workplace. And I just want to encourage people, um, in addition to reaching out to Allison, which I think is more important, um, if you want to talk to me about helping your workplace to create belonging and equity, please do so. You can find me at metaclusive.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Allison. Bye. Thank you.